uh, Iowa winners ultimately win the nomination. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think in like 2008, John McCain, I think he only came in like third or fourth in the Iowa. He came in fourth. He was actually yeah. behind Fred Thompson, and that's something to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, his we, camp, we played that cartoon. A, <laughs> yeah, uh, if, you, if you remember, David, uh, John McCain was about to suspend his campaign. You know, he was about to close his last office, I believe. That's right. That's right. He was and on then, the And then the establishment flocked to him and said, we will back you, you know, just stay in the race. We'll do whatever, whatever we can to ensure that you stay in the race and you look electable. Yeah, because they really wanted Barack Obama yeah. in there. Yeah. They, know, let, let's try to get this old, old white guy who's older than dirt, as he said about himself, and let's put a young, charismatic black guy in because he's going to do everything we want. And I uh -huh. think a lot of Democrats, still, some Democrats realize that they've been betrayed by Obama, but uh, I think most of them don't want to admit that. Well, he was elected on a bunch of lies. I was, he promised yeah. he was going to do all this stuff that he didn't do or is very slowly doing. Like transparency. Yes. He was going to have the most transparent and, of course, the only thing transparent about his administration has been the criminality. Right. Yeah, remember, and uh, he was going to really protect whistleblowers. Then yeah. he deleted that off his website. Yeah, remember, Jakaria, about two years ago, you and me, we went to the UT campus. Obama yes. was speaking. And they wouldn't even let us into the building. Jakari had a actual White House-approved press, uh, press, pass. press pass. Yeah, because... Rarely do, when we go to events like this, do we, uh, you know, show up with press passes or get credentialed or whatever, because the First Amendment is our press pass. But, you know, it was Obama, and I knew they weren't going to hear that. So I actually went, and I had my credentialed press pass. I got all of the stuff. Kids showed up there as well. You know, he's going to, you know, be my camera guy. And I get up there, and they say, uh, you can't go in. I'm like, what do you mean I can't go in? I got my press pass right here. And they said, oh, the Secret Service didn't approve you. So they were handpicking <laughs> the guys they were going to yeah. let into the room with Obama himself. Yeah. We're going to get in, what, what were we, like 400 yards away from the yeah. motorcade? We saw guys out there running around with snipers and all that. Yeah, they let the uh, uh, amnesty protesters that were demanding us into deportations, they let them the closest to Obama. They pushed the media, you and me, all the mainstream media back even further away than that. Mm -hmm. And the night before... <laughs> I was on campus to try to shoot some footage of Bill Clinton when he was leaving a rally, uh, not a rally, it was, it was some speech. And I was talking to this mainstream uh, uh, photojournalist who was there because he'd never shot any, he never told me he never got any photos of Bill Clinton before. He told me the press access was the worst he's ever seen it and for however long he's been working in the industry, about years. And I mean, he was just uh, mirroring what the uh, AP uh, uh, White House correspondent, like president, I think they have some sort of association was saying that the press access right now under the Obama administration is the worst it's ever been. Well, you so, know, Ken, I don't think, I, you know, I'm not a supporter of Obama, as people <laughs> may know, no. but I don't think that that's Obama. I think that's an institutional paranoia. Let me give you an example. The Pope is coming to, uh, close to El Paso, okay? Now, El Paso is on the American side. I don't know what this, the Mexican city is on the other side, but he's actually going to the Mexican right. city. But it's only where they're going to have the rally is just on the other side of the river. So uh -huh. anybody uh, that's in El Paso, any Americans that were there, they could easily go down to the river and just look right across it, and they would be able to see the rally. In Mexico, they're encouraging everybody to come see the Pope. But on the American side, yes. they're threatening people saying you will not get any, they're going to cordon it off, they're going to keep everything away to protect the Pope. See, that's the difference between the American uh, security paranoia and what's going on in Mexico. And so I would basically say to uh, the people in Mexico, you really sure you want to come across the border and live amongst, no, <laughs> amongst this yeah, I mean, paranoid security state? Because that city is one of the most dangerous, it's like the murder capital there. I mean, yeah. It's one of the most dangerous. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, that I think a lot of what you're seeing is going to get ramped up even worse the next time. Because it's just like what we saw. Uh, every time there's a shooting or anything that happens, uh, they go full-blown martial law. That's what we just saw up in Oregon with the shooting of Lavoie Finnecombe. Here's a bunch of people out in the middle of nowhere. And he had said the day before he got shot, he goes, all of a sudden, we used to be able to have cordial conversations the with the FBI. And now they won't talk to us. They get out of the car. They've got the guns drawn. He does this. And he goes, they're very confrontational. They have ramped up the number of people. They've ramped up the equipment. They're doing constant flyovers with uh, planes and with drones. He goes, why all of a sudden the saber rattling? Why are they getting confrontational? Do they want to provoke violence? And, of course, the next day they killed him. And, mm -hmm. and so we see that kind of paranoia of the government's security state. And I think it's only going to increase. It is independent, I think, of whoever is in the White House. Mm. Yeah, I mean, bottom line is that uh, George Soros, we saw this in Ferguson. I tried to talk to a protest group up there that just got raided by the cops. I think Marcos was there. They wouldn't even, they let me, they made me sit outside for 45 minutes and then they told me they didn't want to talk to me. 
And sure enough, a couple of weeks later, we find out that all these groups were being funded by Soros for like what I think thirty-three million dollars. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what they're the doing is they're trying protesting to get protesting because they didn't get their checks. Yeah, they're trying to get the uh, <laughs> local citizens to fight against their local government. Yeah. So then the feds can just take, go in and take, federalize everything, take power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. when you can't even work with your local government, that's when tyranny is really going to come into your uh, community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So we're seeing that over and over again. Mm -hmm. Do we have uh, Richard and the um, and set up in the uh, Trump? They're having some issues with the okay. network. We might just have to wait. Well, you know what? I think, uh, yeah, I think basically what we'll do is have them make a report because um, and, and file that report as to what they see there. I'd like to get that live, but if we're having some problems setting up, I don't, there's not really, I think we have got the returns as far yes. as they're going to go. And again, to repeat that, uh, we've got Ted Cruz at 28% with six delegates. We've got uh, Trump at 24% uh, and Rubio at 23%. So Cruz gets six delegates. Trump and Rubio get five. Carson gets one at 9%. Nobody else gets anything. Huckabee says goodbye. And we've had O'Malley say goodbye on the Democrat side. On the Democrat side, they are essentially tied 50-50. Let's pull that up and take a look at uh, how the delegates are allocated on the Democrat side again. Yeah, it's uh, a really 50-50 now. Yeah, it is 50-50 on the popular percent. It's a 0.2% split right now, according to Microsoft. Wow, it is, it it is exactly 50-50. I wonder how come if they're 50-50, uh, she gets 20 delegates and he gets 17. <laughs> I <laughs> guess it a... pays to know somebody, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what they're showing point, David. on CNN. They're showing them 50-50, but she gets 20 delegates and he gets 17. I guess she gets extra points for being female. Um, I, <laughs> she gets extra points for being a Clinton. That's what it is. Right. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, he's just a, he's just an old white guy, and he is old. He's seventy five. He'll be seventy five if he uh, were to win the uh, the contest. Well, thank you for joining us. That's the end of our coverage for the Iowa caucus. I'm David Knight with Leanne McAdoo and Jakari Jackson, and we'll continue to cover more developments as they come along with the presidential race. Thanks for joining us. Knockout is back. If you want a product that has 10 known ingredients that naturally get your body to relax, your brain to relax, so you get deep, restful sleep, knockout's it. Infowarslife.com. L-theanine, hops flower extract, lemon balm extract, valerian root extract, chamomile flower extract, L-tryptophan extract, melatonin, and more. All organic, all the natural sources. It's the same price as leading brands of melatonin that are three milligrams a piece. It has three milligram, the standard recommended dose for an adult. It's got the GABA, so it would probably cost $50 to take all this as separate pills. It's $19.95. You take one or two of these, and it just is really clean, restful sleep is what the reviews are. It's what I've experienced, and it just synergistically puts everything in there. Infowarslife.com. That's Infowarslife.com, or call 888-253-3139. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.
can't take it anymore. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News live coverage of the Iowa caucus kicking off the 2016 election campaign. I'm David Knight. With me are Leanne McAdoo and Jakari Jackson. We're going to be covering this as the results come in. Now, they have just started the caucus at this moment. 7 o'clock Central Time is when the Iowa caucus begin. They expect this year they're going to have results early, and that's something we're going to talk about is, is what the caucus process is and, of course, Microsoft's involvement in this. We're also going to look back at uh, the history of the Iowa caucus. We're going to look at, back at what has happened in the last couple of weeks with uh, the debates with the candidates. It's going to be a little bit more than just a horse race comparison, but, of course, this is now the actual horse race begins. Yeah. This is uh, beyond the push polls, beyond all the pundits handicapping everybody. So now tonight it begins. Yeah, well, this will be very exciting. I know there's a lot of uh, first timers out there at the caucus that can't wait to to be heard and have their voices raised there. And um, we're, we're going to be seeing a lot of peer pressure going on. I guess that's how the the Democratic caucuses go. It's more kind of you pressure your groups into voting for yours or uh, in the cruise camp, you send out peer pressure mailers. To <laughs> phony, phony mailers, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we'll also have Richard Reese, who's on the ground out there in Iowa, so he'll have a chance to give right. us an eyewitness take and also talk to the great viewers who are actually out there in the area. That's right. Now, tonight, we're going to take a look quickly at the difference.